Well, good morning. That's what I like to hear, a little more awake, awaken than the other group this morning. Good to see you got that extra hour of probably not sleep, but anyway, it's good to see you here. Um, we have several things going on, but the first thing I want to do is say welcome to First Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us, we hope you consider yourself a guest, not a visitor. If you look at the end of your pews, member or guest, there's a little black book called a Friendship Register. Please, everyone, put your name down there. If you're a guest and can give us some contact information, we would appreciate that. If you know of a special ministry need, uh, please write that in there. We do look at these each and every week, and it's a great tool to get from the um, pew to the pulpit, so to speak. Your bulletins, you have those with you. Look at them, please. There are many, many announcements in there. Let me tell you about two very important ones. The first one that's incredibly important is now's the time to nominate our deacons for the upcoming year. So you'll see the, the insert in your bulletin for that. There's a box in the back and a box outside of this door. Please fill these out. If you're a member of First Baptist, and there, there is information on the front, if you're a member of First Baptist, fill this out, please, and put it in the box. Secondly, you'll see the um, Mother-Son Trampoline Park activity coming up. This is for all ages. So, you know, if you're a 60-year-old mom with a 40-year-old son, come on out and bounce. That is fine. Um, and if someone does that, please, someone else, take pictures for me. Um, but anyway... That could be quite funny. But anyway, we've got that coming up, the, the mother-son trampoline park. Many other things listed in the bulletin, including, hard to believe it, but this Wednesday, living Christmas tree tickets come out. So if you want to get your living Christmas tree tickets, there are guidelines listed there for our church members um, right at the very top up there for the living Christmas tree ticket distribution, upcoming listening sessions and such. And one thing that was not in there is once again, they're some selling luminaries through 1117 for our Relay for Life team. These luminaries will be lit during the Relay for Life in May in honor and memory of someone who's been touched by cancer. And a listing will also be provided in the Living Christmas Tree program in 2019. Each luminary requires a $10 donation or a purchase of three for $25. And there'll be someone outside the sanctuary door right out here if you would like to sign up today. But again, Please, please look at your bulletin for all the things we have going on at First Baptist and see where God is calling you to be a part. Now let's do one of my favorite parts of the worship service. Let's stand up and greet one another. kind only father i just want to thank you for this wonderful day and the blessing you've given us lord and lord i just want to thank you for bringing us all here today one lord for us to have a little bit of fun lord for us to fellowship lord and for us to learn lord just open up our hearts take the lessons that we're going to get today that we can take into our hearts and take out in our weeks and help us change our little town of salisbury our little county of rowan our state and our world in the wonderful name of jesus christ amen
musicians, and if their parents would stand so that they can see where you are, they can go back to their seat. From Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. Would you join with us as we sing together hymn 43, This Is My Father's World. Please stand as we sing. Anybody else want to come down? <laughs> this is great. I love this. How many sang just a while ago? Raise your hand. Very nice. Very nice. Come on down. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> You're going to help me, okay? You want to help me some? I have this effect on many children. <laughs> Tell me your name. Yeah. What's his name? Scott. 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 What a nice, and what a nice name he's got. Scott. Scott. Do you know I'm a Scott too? Yeah. Do I look like a Scott? Names are important, aren't they? When I called his name, he looked up. He stopped crying. When somebody calls your name, you stop and look up too. Names are awfully important. In fact, they're so important, I know what some of your names mean because I looked them up. First of all, let me have Ada Bronson stand up. Where's Ada Bronson? Ada Bronson, do you know your name means noble and kind? You are noble and kind. That's what your name means. Scott's helping me over here. Uh, tell me where Adeline Yost is. Where's Adeline? I saw Adeline. Stand up, please. Adeline means noble and kind, too. Can you imagine? I like the noble part of where you are. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Amen Bronson. Miss Bronson. Yes. Now, I know your name's in the Bible, isn't it? But do you know what your name, 
means? Honest woman. Are you an honest woman? You had to watch Dad, didn't you? <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Aubrey Lancaster, where's Aubrey at? Aubrey, noble and bright. Like that noble and bright. All right, let me see here. Who's the next one? Um, I'm doing me in alphabetical order. Where's Ava? Ava, where's Ava? Stand up, please. Do you know what your name means? Now, I realize that sometimes we have names because they're, we're named after family members and things like that. Your name means like a bird. <laughs> Y'all can say, ah, oh, now, if you'd like. <laughs> like a bird. Thank you. All right. I'm not, not going to fly away now. All right. Let's see. Who else we got here? Ava, about six. Ah. Oh. Daniel Lancaster, you are not the guy I saw pray earlier. Are you sure that's your name? Do you know what your name means? What does your name mean? God is my judge. Give him a hand. That's exactly right. That means he's your judge too, by the way. <laughs> All right, let's see. Ethan Robbins, where's young Ethan? Ethan Robbins, nice looking man right there. Ethan Firm and strong is what Ethan means. I can see that. Give me one of these. Excellent. <laughs> we'll be here all day if y'all start clapping. <laughs> all right. Kristen Lancaster. Where's Kristen? Kir well, say that again. Say it again. Thank you. You know what that name means? Be proud of that name. It means Christ bearer. Christ bearer. Don't be messing around with her now. Christ bearer. Thank you so much. And let's see here. I've got somebody else. Lydia. Where's Lydia Bronson? Is she in here? She went downstairs. Well, that's okay. She's the girl over here who looked like she was from Greece. It means the little girl who looks like she comes from Greece is what Lydia means. <laughs> no, it really does. <laughs> All right. Let me give you uh, one or two more. Maisie. Where's Maisie? Maisie. No, she's right there. Do you know how I knew? Because her name means pearl. Pearl. Yes. Don't be embarrassed. It means pearl. All right, let me give you one more. Sammy, uh, Savannah. Where's Savannah? Savannah, yes? You're not Savannah. Are you Savannah? Do you know what your name means? All right, I got it right down here. Treeless Plain. I know, you have to think about that a little bit. Huh? It's like a level grass. It's like when the Bible talks about green meadows. That's you. It means green meadows. Thank you, Savannah. That's what a Savannah means, by the way. All right, let's do one more. Got 12. Where's Scarlet? I met Scarlet earlier. No, your family is Scarlet. Do you know what that Scarlet means? I'll give you a hint. It's probably a pretty good name. Flaming Red. I know. I don't understand that either. We'll have to talk to your parents. Thank you so much. Do you know some of the staff have names? Do you know what our names mean? What's your name? Estelle. I tell you what, if I didn't call your name, I will be right up here after the service and I will tell you what your name means, okay? But these guys will be upset if I don't tell them what their names mean. See Brian up here? Do you know what his name means? Firm and strong. That makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, Russ over here is a mystery to me. Where's Russ? He goes with Scarlet. It means redhead. <laughs> Want to see that bottle, don't we? Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Jenna. This is do you know what Gemma means? Meet me over here right after the service and I'll tell you what Gemma means. You know what it means? What does it mean? It means precious gem. Your name means precious gem? Oh, give her a big hand. It means precious gem. You are precious too. All right. Uh, Rust means redhead. Pastor John, you know what Pastor John's name means? Pastor John, do you know what your name means? 
Lord have mercy. <laughs> I heard an amen too. It was your wife. Where is she? She's supposed to be sitting over here. All right. Names are important because names tell us who we are. It names tell us our history. We like to hear our names called. Do you know something else who likes to hear their name called? Back there, do you know who likes to hear their name called? Jesus likes to hear his name called. Can you call his name right now? Jesus. Jesus. Oh, everybody together. One, two, three. Jesus. Now, if you call on the name of Jesus, I got two verses I need to tell you. The first one is from Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Rejoice because your names are in heaven. Heaven's already got your name written down, and it's not like this. It's got your name, and my guess is it's got your picture up there, too. Also, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. I got a little gift for you. and You got to pay attention to this. Don't be talking to him. All right, here's what I'd like for you to do. I want everybody out here to say your name before you leave. As you walk out, I want them to know who you are. So Pastor Brian is going to get some cards, and I'm going to get some cards, and I want your parents to write your name on these cards. Tear it off the back, and you can put your name on the card. So all these people will say, it's good to see you, and then say your whole name. Won't that be nice? All right, precious Jim, I got one for you. And then we're going to have a little prayer. All right, here. You need some more? Oh, I didn't know so many children would come. All right, I'll get some more and have them out here a little bit later. You got some? You need some? All right. I got one. Oh, thank you. You need one? Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, there's one. You've got one on your back already. All right. Has everybody got one? No. Okay. Oh, you don't have? All right, well, I'll tell you what you all to do who don't have any names. Make sure you meet somebody and say, hey, I'm so-and-so. Would you do that? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Everybody bow your head. Close your eyes. Jesus, thank you for our names. Thank you for allowing us to have the special names that we have. Because each name means something to you. Because each person means something to you. Thank you for making us special. Thank you for parents and families and churches that love us. Remind us, God, that we are most full, most meaningful, most loved. Not so much when we hear our names, but when we say your name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's children said, Amen. Thank you for coming. Parents, raise your hands if you want these children back. You are.
and offerings this morning. We want to uh, ask the church to be praying. Uh, Debbie, everybody knows Debbie Yokely. Debbie, raise your hand. So anybody that does this, this is Debbie Yokely. One week from today, Debbie's probably be, will be headed to the airport about now to get on a plane bound for Cairo, Egypt. She's going on a mission trip. And uh, I just want to ask you, if you'll be praying for Debbie, let her know that. Just raise your hand and say, I'll be praying for Debbie on your trip. Debbie, we can't wait to hear uh, what God's going to show you and teach you and do through you uh, on that trip. So we will be praying for you. God bless you and for the good example you're setting for the rest of us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity to come and worship you. And Lord, we do ask that you be with Debbie as she travels to Egypt on a mission trip, Lord, to spread the word of your name. But Lord, we also ask that you be with these tithes and offerings, that each one is a joyful giver, Lord, uh, back to you. We just pray that this money will be used to glorify your name, and we just ask all these things in thy name. Amen.
I enjoyed that. I hope you did too. If you uh, would like some notes for the message today, we haven't quite got everybody used to the fact that those are available. Don't expect everyone to take one. We don't have one for it, but if you'd like notes for the message today, raise your hand. Our ushers can get some of those to you. Uh, Our ushers can get some of those to you. Let's see. I think I had ushers lined up to do this. Rod, there aren't any there. They're all in the back. You all be patient with that. I'll ask you to raise your hand in just a moment uh, again, unless they've all been given out. Take your Bibles and turn to Jonah chapter 1. I realized when I was reading this morning, we had people standing still looking for their scripture. So I'll give you a head start uh, on that. Uh, Anybody... uh, come to uh, Sunday school this morning thinking that you were going to worship service. Anybody want to be honest? Ah, oh, all right. We had, we, had, we had some people maybe forgot about, the, uh, forgot about the time change. It was nice to drive this morning when it was daylight from Mint Hill instead of getting in the car when it was dark. Uh, so I, I enjoyed that opportunity to drive in the light uh, this morning. Some of you may be familiar. Now we have those notes. Anybody want those notes? Raise your hand. We have a few to give out. Children, especially if you didn't get them when you came in, uh, keep those hands raised. Experiencing God was a a study that was first published in 1990. Henry Blackaby uh, is a well-known author and speaker in Southern Baptist life, and he was the author of of that study. And it was an eye-opening and life-changing experience Uh, for the thousands of people that participated in that study. I was one of them. I include myself in that number as far as it being a life-changing experience. It was a great study. Uh, How many here remember taking this study uh, when it might might have, maybe even in the last few years or 30 years ago, however long? A good number of you have. I think we'd all agree this morning uh, that as a church and individually, We want to experience God's presence, His direction, His activity in our lives, and especially in our church during this transition time. We need God to lead us to our next pastor. We need His help. We need Him to make us the strong light in this community that He calls us to be. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to revisit the seven realities of how we experience God's activity in our lives as Christians. Except we're going to put a little bit of a different twist on it. We're going to compare these seven realities to the prophet Jonah's experience with God. Somebody might ask, why would you want to compare Jonah? Jonah got it all wrong. Exactly. Because I don't know about you, but as humans... Sometimes we learn better from making mistakes, don't we? Anybody remember touching that hot stove or iron for the first time? Bet you didn't make that mistake again. And so let's learn from Jonah uh, as we look at these seven realities. Believe me, Jonah made plenty of mistakes. He was human. He was flawed, just like me, get just like you as well. So maybe we can learn from him. Let's read the first part of his story together from the first chapter of Jonah, chapter 1. Would you stand in honor of God's word if you're able this morning? Jonah, chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound from that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, 
let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on who? Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven. Notice that. I worship the Lord God of heaven. But he wasn't doing a very good job of it right then, was he? Who made the sea and the land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O oh Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. May you be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Let's set the background. Nineveh was a major city of the Assyrians who were a cruel and warlike people. They lived alongside the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in an area of the world we're very familiar with now, eastern Syria, northwestern Iraq. They were longtime enemies of Israel. Their artwork emphasized war, including scenes of execution, impalement, and even worse things that I won't describe this morning. The mere mention of the Assyrian name would bring their neighbors feelings of fear and dread and animosity. Now, Jonah's story is well known. Our children learn it very early in Sunday school. They sing songs about Jonah. But what are we to make about Jonah's inclusion in our Bible? What are we to think of it? Some would want to make Jonah's story an Old Testament parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Others vigorously defend Jonah as a real person and these as real events. 2 Kings chapter 14 verse 25 reveals to us that there was indeed a prophet named Jonah who lived in the northern kingdom of Israel in the 8th century BC. Jonah is one of the 12 minor prophets and all the other minor prophets are historical figures and accounts. But the biggest factor in believing the reality of this account are the words of Jesus. For twice in Luke's gospel, G Jesus talks about Jonah's time inside the fish, the sign of Jonah, and that his time in the tomb would be similar to the time that Jonah spent inside the fish. Whatever you believe, my hope is that you will take Jonah's story seriously, even as Jesus took it seriously. For there is much to learn from the experience of this man. Now, Henry Blackaby, in his life as a pastor and as a professor, as he studied the Bible and as he experienced life himself, he found, he saw in the scriptures a pattern of seven realities of how God uh, makes himself known and how people of the scriptures encountered God working in their lives. He called these the seven biblical realities of experiencing God. The seven biblical realities of experiencing God. Reality number one is simply this. God is always at work around you. God is always at work around you. We've read in the scripture and we've seen that God was at work in Jonah's day. The father was aware of how wicked the Assyrians were. You might ask me, how wicked were they, pastor? Well, think 
Abu, Bak Abu Bakar al-Baghdadi, wicked. I know I butchered the of that, pronunciation of that name. Think that wicked. And God could have destroyed these people, these evil people, without a word. But God chose to use a man to work in a man's life to warn that city of their impending destruction. This reminds us that you never know where God might be planning to take you. For God had some even bigger plans up his sleeve. Jonah seemed to sense, he had an idea that this was the case, that it wasn't just going to be going to Nineveh and preaching, that was going to be the end of it. He sensed that God had something more planned in this event. We'll see that later in our story in another week. Again, if you will take a step of faith, if God's speaking to you and you take that first step in obedience, there's no telling what will open up to you and how God will use you to make an eternal difference in the world today. God not only was at work in Jonah's day, God was at work in Jesus' day. Jesus said in John chapter 5, My Father is always at His work to this very day, and I too am working. Those of you that have your notes, underline, always at His work. The rest of the congregation say, always at His work. How often is God working? He's always at His work. Has that reality, reality changed today? Even when we don't see it, even when I don't feel it or understand it, our Father is always at work in this world that He created. Jesus went on to say in John chapter 5, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by Himself, he can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son does also. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Whatever the father does, the son does also. Who's our example? Jesus is. Jesus is our example. He came, and that's the reason he, one of the reasons he came was to live in human flesh and to show you and me God's plan for men and women that he created. This is how we were meant to live. Jesus is our example. And as our example, what did Jesus do? Did he just do his own thing every day? No. Jesus is part of the Trinity. They are in union. And so he looked to see the Father and see what the Father was doing and what the Father was doing. He joined in on that. That was where he worked, where the Father was already working. If Jesus needed to look to where the Father was working before he took the first step, what makes us think that we can do th anything different than that? What makes us think as Christians that we can just put our faith on autopilot and just move and cruise through every day without taking the time to pray, without taking the time to look into God's Word, without taking the time to hear God speak and allowing His Holy Spirit to help us rightly interpret events going on in and around our lives so we know how we respond. We need to look to see what the Father is doing. Jesus seemed to always be bumping into people in whom God was at work. Do you think that was a coincidence? Jesus was looking for just those very people. Why in that crowd in Jericho did he march through the crowd and go to a tree and look up in a tree and say, Zacchaeus, come down. Because Jesus knew that the Father was already at work in this little man's life. When he met the woman at the well. Why, why did he stay there when the disciples went to get lunch? Jesus knew that God was working in this woman's life. The, the demoniac whose name was Legion. It might not seem like it on the outside, but Jesus knew that inside uh, this demon-possessed man, there was somebody who wanted to be free and wanted a different life. God was at work, and God was at work through his son, Jesus. Even in his own disciples. Jesus was always looking for opportunities for teachable moments. And Scripture reveals there were plenty of opportunities for teachable moments in the lives of the disciples. One day, uh, what, the church where Henry Blackaby served as pastor uh, sensed that, that God was leading their church to begin a, a Bible study ministry in a nearby college. 
And so they began to attempt to start a Bible study and it fell on its face and the second attempt fell on its face. And for over a year they attempted to begin a Bible study in the dorms of that local college and it simply did not work. They were getting nowhere. So one Sunday, Dr. Blackaby called some of the students of the church that were, were, had such a burden to start this ministry. He called them together and he said, this week I want you to go on campus and watch to see where God is working and join him. So they kind of looked at him with a puzzled look and explain what you mean, Dr. Blackaby. He shared with them John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Then Dr. Blackaby told the students, no one is going to seek God on his own initiative. When someone is inquiring about spiritual matters, it is a clear sign that God is working in his or her life. If someone asks you this week a spiritual question, drop what you're doing, whatever you're doing, and join in with what God is doing. Wednesday of that week arrived and Dr. Blackaby received a call and the girl said, Pastor, a girl who has been in classes with me for two years came to me after class today. She said, I think you might be a Christian. I need to talk to you. But she had a, a class. The, the, lady from the, the young lady from the church had a class immediately following the first class. She said, but I skipped the class and went to the cafeteria to talk with her. The girl related, seven of us girls have been studying the Bible. Excuse me, 11 of us girls have been studying the Bible and none of us are Christians. Do you know somebody who can lead us in a Bible study? The church began three Bible studies in a short period of time in the women's dormitories of that college and two Bible studies in the men's dorm during that same time. For over a year, the church had been attempting to do something for God and they failed. For three days, they looked to see where God was working and they joined in what God was doing and look at the difference it made. Church, how often are we as Christians guilty of saying, God, you know, I'd like to do this, or I'm going to do this, or I want to do that, and sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Maybe several other people will raise their hand. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea, and we go off doing our thing, and nothing comes of it. Could it be that we made the same mistake that Dr. Blackaby's church made? We don't take the time to pray as we should, and to seek God as we should, and, and to look and see God is already at work. He's already working. We need to pray for God to work. We need to believe that he is working. We need to open our spiritual eyes to see how he is working around us as we seek a new pastor for our church. Today, at the close of the service, we're, we're going to ask our pastor search committee to come forward and we're going to have a, a special commissioning prayer for them. We want to remember in these days that we're not asking them to go out in their own wisdom. We're not asking them to take their own ideas about who or what we need in a pastor and, and get a pastor that pleases them. We're not asking them even to take our ideas and our thoughts and go get the pastor that pleases us. More than anything else, we need to get the pastor that pleases whom? The Lord, that's right. We need to seek His will. We need to look to see where he's working. We need to pray that not only will he be working among us, but we need to pray that already, and we need to believe that already he's working in the life of the pastor that he will call to us and that he will be seeing God at work around him and since God working in him. We need to pray together. God, give us eyes to see you working, you speaking to your church right now. God, give us eyes to see you working in the community around us. Give us faith to believe that you're working in the life of just the right person to come and lead us in our mission as a church in the future. God is working in and through this church, I believe, even right now. God's working through mission teams that go to an impoverished county in Kentucky to share his hope and love. 
God is working here at First Baptist through the access ministry, encouraging and loving on those with special needs. God's working through the medical clinic across the street on Thursdays uh, for people here in the community. God's working through our youth and others that w went with them on their mission trip to Guyana this summer. God's working through the teams helping clean up from the hurricanes uh, on numerous occasions. God will be working, has been working in Debbie's life and will work through her life and the life of the mission team she goes with next week. And there's so much more that I haven't even learned about yet, but God is at work in his church if we'll open our eyes to see it. And yet there's so much more he wants to do. And the point of me sharing about all those ministries and the fact that God is at work, what I want to encourage and challenge you in, if you're not a part of what God is doing, don't let these people have all the blessings. There's a blessing for you. There's a blessing for you to give, but we'll learn that the word of Scripture is true. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. But in the giving, we'll receive the blessing. So believe that God is at work and believe that God wants to work through you. God is at work in our day. He's working in the world around us. God has not given up on it on his world. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. There's more, there are more battles to be fought. Jesus who died shall be satisfied. I'd like to almost insert the word, word glorified there. He will be glorified and earth and heaven be one. Are you working for that or is God working through you to accomplish that? Open your eyes and see where God is working and then jump in. Jump in the ring and work where God would call you. The second reality, God not only is always at work, the second reality tells us that God pursues a continuing love relationship with you and me that is real and personal. God pursues a relationship, a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. One thing that is easily missed in this story is how incredibly patient God is and that God wanted to do more than just use Jonah as his puppet. Jonah, this is what I want you to do. Now, do it now or else. No, God didn't want to use Jonah like a puppet on a string. God wanted a genuine relationship with Jonah. A genuine relationship with him. That's why he was so patient with Jonah. Jonah rebelled against God's will and fled in the opposite direction. But God didn't give up on his prophet. He disciplined Jonah. He wouldn't just let Jonah go away and stay away from his presence. I wonder when Jonah went down to the seaport called Joppa and started to get on the on the boat, I wonder if he was married. I wonder if his wife was there to say goodbye to him. Can't you imagine his wife just saying as he was going uh, up the gang plant plank, Honey, I've been telling you, I've got a bad feeling about this trip. You told me that God said go this way, but you're going that way. I don't think this is going to turn out well. How many of us men could say, yes, my wife's tried to give me numerous times the advice, don't do that, but I didn't listen to her, and it didn't turn out so well either. This morning on the way here, uh, I'm driving a, a car from the local Hyundai dealership, a loaner. Uh, the good news is it's only got 250 miles on it, so it's almost a brand, it's a brand new car. Bad news is I have it because uh, the, my engine blew just when I was getting started here on Wednesday. So they're putting a new engine in my car. As I was on 485, I was about to put my left turn signal on and started to change lanes. And all of a sudden I looked in the rear view mirror and all of a sudden this icon came on and it glowed. I said, well, what about that? And then I looked over and there was an icon in the right side view mirror as well. And it these fancy new cars, these smart cars. You're about ready to change lanes and there's a car in the lane you're going to. The light lights up. Look at that. Warning, don't go here, right? 
Jonah ignored all the warnings, whatever they were. We don't read about him receiving many, but don't you know that, that God probably gave him plenty? God just saying clearly do this is warning enough, isn't it? But God was working even though Jonah was ignoring the warnings not to do what he chose to do. God was working even through Jonah's prejudice. Jonah was a prejudiced man. We'll talk more about that in another message. But God was patient with Jonah and worked to reveal to him how sinful his prejudice really was. God's desire was that he, take, he would be able to take the things that were wrong in Jonah's life and make them right. He would like to do that in your life this morning. Whatever is troubling you, whatever is wrong, whatever is less than he intends for it to be, God would like to make that whole, make it right today. You put the two realities that we've talked about thus far together that God is always at work in the world around you, that God wants a love relationship with you. You put the two together and we discover that God is not only at work around you, God wants to work in your life too. And so his word tells us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give to you are to be upon your, where? Your hearts. They're to be on your hearts. God desires a faith that is not just superficial, but he desires a heartfelt faith where we follow him. So he also tells us, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord is your hobby, your pastime, your Sunday morning activity where you go and tip your hat to him once a week. Is that what the Lord is? No, the Lord is your what? Life. The Lord is your life. Do you know the song, Jesus Be the Center? That's what God wants. He wants Jesus to be the center of my life. You see, God's not satisfied with just, me, just with me attending church, my offerings, or even my work for Him. What God desires most from me is my heart. He wants your heart too. Does He have it this morning? How can we grow deep, uh, deeper in our relationship with God? That's where reality three comes in. God invites you to become involved with Him in his work. Reality number three, God invites you to become involved with him in his work. God told Jonah in the very first verse, Jonah, get up, go, speak, join with what I am doing, participate in my plan. And the Bible is filled with examples of God calling ordinary men like Jonah and women as well to accomplish his mission. Abraham was called to father a great nation. Moses was called while tending sheep in the wilderness. Gideon was called and God said, I, I want you to be a mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, who me? But God used him anyway. David was the youngest of his brothers, another shepherd. Jeremiah was called even before he was born, even before the Lord had formed him in his mother's womb. How much more helpless can you get than that? But God called him. Mary was a teenager, yet she was chosen to give birth to the Savior. John the Baptist was the son of a humble priest, yet he was called to herald the arrival of the Messiah. Could it be this morning that God is calling you? And God wants to use you in some special way to be a blessing for Him. You might say, Pastor John, I'm not like those other people. I could never be all that they were or, or do what they did. God's not asking you to be and do like what they did. God is asking you to be the person He created you to be. And to accomplish the task, the mission that He has specifically for you. Do you remember Last week's message, Peter and John, and how God healed the crippled man miraculously through them. 
when the Jewish leaders they were brought to saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were what kind of men? Unschooled and ordinary men. They were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. That they couldn't see anything in Peter's pedigree or John's background that said, here's an outstanding leader. Here's the person I would choose to, to be the entrepreneur and, and to work to bring up this new endeavor so that it would flourish. No, they saw just the opposite. It astonished them that God was working in such a mighty way, in a way they couldn't deny it even though they wanted to. God was at work, and so it was astonishing to them, and they couldn't help but make the link between Peter and John and a man whose name was Jesus. There, we're saying that name again, aren't we? Jesus. Jesus made all the difference, and God used these ordinary men to ignite a flame that would become the early church. James tells us that Elijah was a man just like us, just like us, and yet he stood up against the false prophets of the land and turned the hearts of an entire nation back to the Lord. Jonah was a person all too much like you and me, all too much like us as well. But even when Jonah rebelled, God continued to leave the door open for Jonah to change his mind, to have a change of heart, and to respond affirmatively. God's patience. Has God been working in your life? Has God been calling you to stand up, speak His truth, to share His love, to live out the passion that He's put in your heart? And yet you fail to respond. Let me warn you this morning. Let me warn you in love. Don't presume on God's patience. Don't presume on God's patience. Isaiah tells us, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is near. These very words would would lead us to conclude there may be a time when God can't be found. There may be a time when He is not near. Just because the door is open today to respond to God does not mean you'll have the same opportunity tomorrow. Just because God is working today, don't take it for granted that you'll have that same opportunity to respond to His working in your life tomorrow. I like what Rick Warren says. This life is just practice for eternity. We only get one chance at life. Is that right? Is that right? We only get one chance at life. So we better get it right. We better get it right. Church, look around at our land today. Could it be that God might be ready to judge our nation like he was ready to judge Assyria at any moment? Could it be that, that we as a people are on a march to our own destruction? And would it be that God would do that without warning us first? Might it be that God is inviting you this morning to stand up, to find your voice, and to go live out His mission for your life, to provide that warning to your family, to your co-workers, to your community. First Baptist Church, could it be that he's calling us to sound the warning to Salisbury, North Carolina? Could it be that God is at work? He wants to use you and have a relationship with you. He wants to send you out to be salt and light to this desperately needy world. Will you pray with me? God, this morning, would you open our eyes that we might see you at work in the world around us? Lord, open our hearts that we might experience your great love for us. Open our spirits to your Holy Spirit saying, I have a mission for you. God, help us not to be like Jonah, 
and run away from your will for our lives. But Lord, this morning, help us to be like Jesus and to embrace all that you have for us with open arms. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. God might be at work in your life today. God may have been in your life far before this service started, and this is your opportunity to express what God is telling you, what God is leading you to do, some commitment He's calling you to make during this time of invitation. If God is at work, respond to His love, respond to His Spirit, even as we stand and sing together this morning. Thank you, congregation. You may be seated. I'd like to ask that our pastor search committee come forward. David Wisnett, John Carlton, Jim Stringfield, Pete Bogle, Leslie Rich, and Sheila Pravat. We prayed for them after the early service this morning. Church, we want to give you the opportunity to do the same and join with us. The Bible tells us that unless the Lord builds the house, those that labor do what? They labor in vain. They labor for nothing. We are praying and asking and believing that, that God is building a spiritual house here. And we desire the leadership of His Holy Spirit on these men and women as they represent us, as God works through them to select and bring to us our next pastor. Uh, we're going to ask that Pete Teague come and lead us in this prayer this morning. Congregation, we want to invite our, our deacons and anyone that would like to, to come forward to place your hands on the committee uh, and just to show the unity that we as a church have as we are commissioning them on this most important mission uh, for his church. So if you'd like to, come forward and join in the laying on of hands on this committee. Gracious Heavenly Father, first of all, just want to praise you as we consider who you are. 
our creator. Lord, you are sovereign, you are holy, you are faithful, you are loving, you are gracious, you are merciful. We are so thankful for, for all of that. And Lord, that's the kind of God we pray to. And in fact, if you were not that God, we may as well just be talking among ourselves. You have ordained the family and you have ordained the church. And we are so thankful, not only for the church universal, the body of Christ, but we are thankful for this church, First Baptist Church of Salisbury, which is not this building. It is the people that you have brought together to be here. You have blessed us with wonderful leadership for years and years, Lord, and we are so thankful for that, both uh, ministerial and otherwise. You have blessed us with a staff to carry on in this transition time, and we are so thankful for that. And now, Lord, as you set aside, we also join in with you to set aside this committee that uh, has been ordained to do this most important task. Lord, we know that uh, you have called them, and we join in that uh, to, to find that man who will boldly proclaim the word of God unashamedly, to shepherd and lead our people, and to do so with great wisdom and faithfulness. And we know, Lord, that that wisdom only comes from you. I pray, Lord, that this committee will look to you and you only and your word for that wisdom, for that guidance. I pray for tremendous unity among them, Lord. Not that they necessarily agree on every little thing, but that you will unite them and help them to come to the resolution that they need. I pray that they will look to you. I pray that they will obey you and be faithful to you. I pray that they will, as Pastor John has said, look to see what you are doing and join you in that work. Lord, we love you and we trust you. And as we set aside and commission this wonderful group of people to do this very important work, we look forward with great anticipation to what you're going to do through them, through our church, and through this whole process. In the name of Jesus, amen. Congregation, let me remind you that uh, this is the Sunday that we receive our fellowship offering for ministry needs, and there will be uh, ushers at the doors uh, to collect that offering as we leave this morning. Let me also correct a uh, typo in the bulletin and our, our worship guide. Our listening session this afternoon is at 2 o'clock, not at 4. It's at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Even if you've not signed up for that, we've got plenty of room for you to come and take part. In that listening session as we receive input from the congregation that will help our search committee in their work. Uh, so maybe you, you might be a, a spouse of a choir member that's coming for a special choir rehearsal this afternoon. The spouse might come to the listening session at 2 o'clock, but you're invited to come and participate in that. Let's stand together. Join hands with someone near you. Let's pray together. Lord, give us faith that you want to work in my life. You want to use me and that you will use me for eternal purposes, your eternal purposes, as my spirit is willing to say yes to your spirit and your will. Thank you, Jesus, that you care so much for me. Amen. God alone from before time being. 